All right, good evening and welcome to the uh, Contemporary History Institute speaker series. Uh, I'm delighted that uh, today's or this evening's speaker, Professor Jeremy Black, and or the topic, Brexit and Historical Perspective, have piqued your interest. I think this is about the third time we're doing something Brexit related at a time when we thought Brexit would have happened by then, and uh, so it's a history of the future yet again. Um, I'd like to thank Robert Ingram and the George Washington Forum on American Ideas, Politics, and Institutions, whose co-sponsorship has allowed us to bring Jeremy Black to Athens for this evening's talk. So I understand that their share of the bill is uh, uh, supported by the Jack Miller Center through a grant from the Thomas W. Smith Foundation. Now, customarily, one would go through the various credentials of, uh, of the speaker, but if we did that, we'd be here uh, until Brexit had actually been consummated. Uh, so let us just say uh, a, a Cambridge and Oxford educated uh, British scholar who is maybe the most prolific historian of our time, at least in the military history field. I stopped counting some years ago, but, but he's a, a well over 100 books uh, with, with recent works on, the decolon on, on decolonization. Uh, on English nationalism, forthcoming books on the history of strategy, on strategy in World War II, books on cartography, uh, and the history of maps, and so forth, and, and so forth. Um, also, uh, uh, Jeremy is a great friend of the Institute, and therefore I think it's fair to say that since I've seen him in action uh, a few times, that I can promise you both an engaging uh, and an enlightening talk. Uh, the talk itself will be about 50 minutes or so, which should leave us about a half an hour for questions and answers. With that, I hope you will join me in welcoming Jeremy Black back to Ohio University, to CHI, and to the uh, George Washington Forum. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me start with an apology. I have a horrible sore throat, so if I sound more than ordinarily strange, I apologise. Secondly, like, may I say thank you to being invited. I've been here on a number of occasions. I always enjoy coming to Athens. Uh, I think it's a wonderful college town, and it's a particular pleasure to see a number of old friends. It's a particular pleasure to see Steve. It's a particular pleasure to see John. It's a particular pleasure to see Robert. I think, you know, I had the great pleasure of being in Ingo's class this this afternoon. I think uh, the students here are lucky to have such a dynamic and impressive department, and I'm lucky to have the opportunity to see friends, so I'd like to thank you. Now, in talking about Brexit, I am speaking as an academic historian. I make that point uh, because, as I say to my undergraduates, I would like to think when I give lectures they would not be able to have the faintest idea what I think on a topic. Uh, what I want to do is to offer you an interpretation of how we've got here at the present day. I, and if I'm trying to explain things, it is not because I either want to approve or disapprove of them. The vote, after all, is a private matter, uh, and we have a secret ballot in Britain, as you do in the United States, and I think we should stick to that. I think academics should not... Um, as it were, jump into politics because they have no more knowledge about the exact uh, details of the moment than most other people, but what they can do is look back. So what I want to try and do is to focus on how we got first to the referendum, why the referendum occurred, and then why the results were as they were, and then how we've got from there to the present day, and then what might happen into the future. And I also want, because I'm a historian, to try and put this in terms of some longer-range questions about the nature of the relationship between the British and continental Europe, and also about the role of contingency in history, the role of chance, the role of particular moments, because I think that's very significant, and also because I fear, I think we can already see it with people um, explaining, as it were, the, the, the vote in 2016, the, the tendency among commentators, whether they're academics or not, to simplify the past and to explain uh, that something happened because of A or B, which tends to reflect the actual views of the person in question, and not to allow for the complexity of the moment. And I, if I wish to focus on the complexity of the moment, I think that's because that does reflect the nature of a democratic society. So let's start off with the British relationship with what was initially called 
um, the European Economic Community. And I'd like to start that um, in the aftermath of World War II. Now, World War II left um, the continent of Europe in considerable disarray and devastation. And I think it's fair to say that as the states of the continent of Europe addressed their particular issues after World War II, pressure developed within them to see a degree of commonality, a degree of sharing as a response to the situation. It was, if you like, a corollary of NATO uh, in terms of trying to persuade or the working class not to be seduced to communism. So it's an aspect of the Cold War. And I think the degree to which uh, the EEC was an aspect of the Cold War initially tends to be underplayed by commentators on both. Um, but that aspect was one that gathered pace initially with the foundation of the coal and steel community and then subsequently uh, with the treaties that led eventually to the formation of the EEC in 1958. And just to remind you, that in a sense was a deal between the two main players, France and West Germany. Uh, France, um, in a way, wanted to anchor West Germany in a Western Europe in which it felt that French national interests were served, including, in their view, the opportunity to guide any resurgent West Germany in the, a Francophile direction. Uh, the Germans were willing to surrender a portion of their sovereignty in order to be taken back into, as it were, the family of nations, if you want to use that rather 19th century term. And the others came along with. I mean, it wasn't really run by the Benelux countries or Italy. Italy of those was the most significant, and Italy uh, very much wanted a larger trading area, again, to try and anchor its post-war settlement and its new constitution. Italy had only recently become a republic. Like all of the states of continental Europe, all of them had new constitutions. West Germany was a new state. France had had first the Fourth Republic, and then, in 1958, the Fifth Republic. It was a new system. Italy had a new constitution. So all of these were new states trying to define themselves in that context. Now, I think it's fair to say that initially the British didn't see themselves in that light. For very different reasons, uh, neither the Labour Party nor the Conservative Party saw themselves as needing that surrender of sovereignty nor did they feel it was appropriate as far as their political strategies were concerned. Uh, the Labour Party, for example, was very anxious about having nationalised coal. They didn't wish to surrender, as they saw it, control over coal. And they nationalised steel as well. They didn't wish to surrender, as they saw it, control over coal and steel to a European body. The Conservatives were wary about what they saw as the inherent corporatism of Christian democracy. And on both sides, both Labour and Conservative still believed that Britain was a major power. Obviously, independence had come to uh, the states of South Asia um, and also uh, to um, Israel and Jordan. But Britain was still, um, if you look at, let's say, 1956, 57, um, it was still uh, the second largest naval power in the world after the United States, the third atomic power after um, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union, and it still was a major imperial power in Africa, Southeast Asia, the Oceania, and the West Indies. So they still saw themselves as a great power, and they, while wishing well to the European economic community, they didn't see any need to join it. Now, that confidence evaporated at the end of the 1950s. Confidence in Britain's imperial and international position was attenuated greatly by the Suez Crisis and the subsequent bolt from empire. Um, there was a sense of uncertainty over the United States as an ally as a result of America's policy during Suez. And there was growing concern that uh, economic growth rates in Britain could not uh, match those of France or West Germany. 
And by the early 1960s, the Conservative government of Harold Macmillan, who was Prime Minister from 1957 to 1963, was becoming more interested in what you might regard as a more continental policy. Number one, more interested in sort of national planning as the route to try and deal with economic problems within Britain, so corporatism. Number two, uh, more interested in joining the European Economic Community. Well, five of the six members wanted Britain to join. Uh, Charles de Gaulle, the uh, president of France, did not. He, uh, his ostensible, his given reason was that he regarded uh, Britain as a sort of uh, American Trojan horse. I think the real reason was that he correctly assessed that British policy would not always be the same as French policy and that therefore that would challenge the extent to which France was at that stage the dominant policy power within uh, the EEC. So he vetoed it. And the, uh, that was the end of the first attempt to join. Uh, Labour comes into power in 1964 under Harold Wilson. They again try to join the European Economic Community, and yet again, President de Gaulle vetoes it. So at that stage, I think it's fair to say that the extent to which the British public saw Britain as a you know, a European state or a state that should have the same political identity as the EEC was somewhat limited. It was largely presented as an economic argument in order to improve um, the trading nature of the uh, opportunities for Britain. Well, the situation changes in 1969, and as so often, there is a terrible tendency among historians, particularly historians of Britain, but as well, you see the same thing with historians of the United States. They think that the answers are within their own country. Actually, the key change in 1969 was the replacement of General de Gaulle by Georges Pompidou. Pompidou had been de Gaulle's prime minister, but he had a different set of priorities. And Pompidou was worried about the growth of West German power and economic strength. He was worried about early indications of West German interest in uh, détente with Eastern Europe. And he felt that Britain should be brought into the European Economic Community to redress, as, it, as he saw it, um, the overemphasis of, um, of, of power uh, and influence on the part of West Germany. So that provides the basis for the successful negotiations for British entry by the Heath government, the government of Edward Heath, who's a Conservative, from 1970 to 74. I think if you wanted to be critical, and I think Edward Heath was a much overrated figure, the negotiations were also eased by the degree to which Heath was, really, was willing to throw away a lot of British national interest, in order, for example, over agriculture, over trade, in order to facilitate the negotiations. At any rate, Britain joins the European Economic Community in 1973. That is contentious. And the opposition at that time, the Labour Party, has a lot of MPs who don't want Britain to be in the common market. They see the common market as a sort of capitalist plot. Uh, they don't like it. Uh, and when Harold Wilson, the Labour leader, comes to power in 1974, he has to promise, or he feels he has to promise, there is a difference, of course, but he had a tiny uh, majority, uh, feels he has to promise a referendum, something which had never happened in British history before, um, a referendum on continued membership of the European Union. Now, it ought to be said, one other state had had a referendum shortly before, Norway, which had been due to join alongside Britain. Four states were joining together, Britain, Norway, Denmark and Ireland, and Norway had voted not to join. And as you may know, Norway's had another referendum since. Again, it's voted not to join, and as you may know, Norway is not a member of the European Union. So the, there wasn't clear necessarily what would happen when the referendum occurred, but essentially the criticism of staying in Europe um, came from particular points on the political spectrum so that the referendum was largely about the issue, not whether we should be in Europe or not, but the referendum was largely about where you saw yourself on the political spectrum. And in essence, 
the moderate Conservatives and the moderate Labour people voted um, preponderantly to uh, stay in. The more clear-cut left-wingers of the Labour Party and the more clear-cut right-wingers of the Conservative Party voted to leave. That was essentially the way the vote split down. You could debate that, you can play with it in different ways. In Northern Ireland, for example, anti-Catholicism played a role. You know, there are always a multiplicity of factors, but I think that would be the most fair aspect. Anyway, the referendum occurs, and that really ends the issue of the relationship with continental Europe uh, from being a major issue of politics. The rest of the 70s, uh, it's not a major issue. The governability of Britain, the crisis of the last years of the Labour Party, Labour government, means that in 1979, in that general election, there is virtually no discussion of Europe in the, by the party leaders or in the party manifestos. The same in the general elections of 1983 and 1987. Uh, but by the late 80s, there is the development of a sort of more marked Euroscepticism in part of, this, of the British political uh, opinion. And this comes largely as a reaction to the increasing signs that the European Commission is pushing federalism. In other words, the British felt fairly or unfairly, but they felt that they had agreed to sign up to a common trading area um, they didn't feel that they'd agreed to sign up to what was increasingly called, reasonably or unreasonably, you can take your point of view, as a superstate or a superstate in the making. And obviously the person who was most clear about that was the then Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, but I think it's fair to say that her views drew on and reflected a more substantial sense of unease about the policies. And Thatcher famously remarked that she hadn't defeated socialism in Britain, uh, by which she meant Marxism, she hadn't defeated socialism in Britain in order to see it come back through a European superstate. That was her view, and it reflected the fact that um, the European president, the president of the European Commission in the late uh, 1980s, Jacques Delors, had been uh, the French socialist prime minister of France and was quite left-wing. I mean, you know, I should imagine in American politics he would be regarded as completely unmentionable. But he was quite left-wing. Um, so Thatcher very much energised Euroscepticism, and it became an important element of conservative thought. Um, Thatcher falls in 1990, the new Conservative government of John Major, 1990 to 1997, which wins the general election of 1992, um, is a government that increasingly finds that it is having to address Europe as an issue because the European powers, uh, the continental powers, had decide at a conference at Maastricht that they are going to press ahead with a degree of unification. They decide to adopt a common currency, um, the euro. They decide, and to get rid of their own currencies, and they decide on a number of policies related to that which take them more towards the direction of, of, that was very different to what the European economic community. And the EEC becomes, as a result of that, the European Union, the EU, which it is at the present moment. Now, I think it's fair to say that that was not what much of the British wanted. Uh, the Conservative Party was opposed to it. Within the Labour Party, there was a division about the euro. And uh, probably the key decision that is made, which is at the end of the 90s, is as a result of division within the Labour Party. Uh, Tony Blair had won an overwhelming majority in the 1997 general election, and Blair wanted to take Britain into the euro, and he was a very much a European enthusiast. But his Chancellor of the Exchequer, you would call him Secretary of the Treasury, and in fact the equivalent of the number two figure and his rival, Gordon Brown, was completely opposed to going in. He argued that going into the euro would mean that Britain in effect surrendered sovereignty. So he had the same argument as the Conservatives. And the British government decided not to join the Eurozone. And this is the first general point I would like to make out of this narrative. Um, 
prior to the referendum of 2016, we were a semi-detached member of the European Union. The key thing is we weren't part of the euro and therefore weren't part of all the financial and economic arrangements that go with it. Uh, also, for that matter, you're not part of the Schengen Agreement, so that British people have to show their passport when they go to the continent uh, and when they come back to Britain, whereas you don't, when they leave the European Union to come back, areas within Schengen to come back to Britain, and they don't, whereas obviously people on the continent don't have to do that. So there was a semi-detached sense. And a lot of people, both Brexiteers and Remainers, because there's more similar between them than either of them would like to think, a lot of people are apt to forget that. We were a semi-detached member, so that whatever happens in the future, and I'm not sure they will, they will be able to get the Brexit legislation through Parliament, I may be wrong, I don't know, but whatever happens in the future, we will remain a semi-detached member. I think that's a point, and that incidentally is one of the reasons why President Macron of France, who's the most influential figure on the continent, wants Britain out. Uh, he sees its attitude towards Euro convergence as in, irrespective of the referendum result, as a problem from the point of view of his desire, desired development of the European Union. So anyway, Britain decides to not join the Euro, and I think it's fair to say that that again eases the situation. Um, the, uh, as a result of that, um, the European Union uh, our relations with the European Union or within the European are not really contentious issues in the second and third elections that uh, uh, Tony Blair fights. They don't revive as, content as a contentious issue till the economic crisis of 2008. And the economic crisis of 2008 encourages the European Commission to argue that the only way to really cope uh, with the fiscal and social strains caused by that is for further European convergence. And I think it's fair to say that that accentuates Euro European scepticism, or what, what in called in Britain Euro scepticism. It accentuates that um, within, within British politics and the British, and the British government. So, a Conservative government comes in in 2010. It's a coalition government. Uh, most of the MPs are Conservatives, but there are also the Liberal Democrats. And the Prime Minister, David Cameron, um, doesn't wish to leave the European Union, but he is aware that uh, European scepticism is a factor. Cameron is, how shall one put it, uh, well... You know, I've written rather harshly about him. Uh, I've commented that, you know, you expect your politicians to be not necessarily always figures of great integrity or maybe in some cases probity, but you do expect them to be able to do politics. And the one thing that Cameron ran out of is an ability to do politics. He was a glib young man, very self-confident, and he sees referenda as a way to deal with his problems. Now, to an extent, to be fair to him, they were also pushed on him by other political groupings. So in 2011, his Liberal Democrat coalition partners made him have a referendum on changing the voting system, uh, changing towards proportional representation. Could you imagine that in your country, which pretends to be a democracy? But anyway, um, you know, the argument, in other words, that parties should have the same amount of seats in Parliament as a reflection of their percentage of the, uh, the, of the electorate. And Cameron doesn't want that change. Uh, he wants to stick to the constituency system, which is like your system. And uh, in effect, the two parts of the coalition campaign against each other in the referendum, and Cameron wins, so he feels quite happy about that. In 2014, in order to uh, assuage separatist nationalist views in Scotland, where the government is run by the Scottish National Party, uh, the, the British government decides to grant Scotland an independence referendum. Again, uh, Cameron is against, you know, he, they grant the, the referendum, but Cameron doesn't want uh, the referendum to succeed, uh, campaigns against it quite actively, 
And for a while, it's pretty close, but in the end of the day, it's 55% um, to stay uh, within the United Kingdom and 45% to leave. So Cameron is de delighted and feels confident in his assumption that referenda will work <coughs> for him. Now, as a result of that, he chooses to respond to growing pressure within his own party that is Eurosceptical, which he does not share that view and does not, uh, he doesn't like the European Commission, he finds them a nuisance and complains about them, but he thinks that Britain should stay in the uh, European uh, Union. He decides that the way to, as he saw it, prick the bubble of dissent uh, was to grant a referendum and he assumed that that referendum would, um, would as it were, um, end the, you know, the, the Euroscepticism. It would destroy it as a meaningful political force. And um, the Labour Party, aware that Euroscepticism also has a degree of popularity, is willing also to go along with that. So in the 2015 general election, both the major political parties campaign within their manifesto. I mean, obviously, this isn't the prime issue they're campaigning about, but each of them in their manifesto say that if elected, they will hold a referendum on continued membership of the European Union. Well, Cameron wins an outright majority. He's no longer in coalition with the Liberal Democrats and feels that he has to have a referendum. Now, that's interesting because, how should one put it, in a way that would be inconceivable here, politicians don't always do that they, what they've promised. <laughs> All right? And there had been examples. The most egregious instance is Mr Blair, who had a long track record of promising things and not doing them, including promising a referendum he didn't hold. Uh, there had been examples of people not doing this. But Cameron feels that he has to. He feels that this is the way to quieten some of his MPs and to quieten some of his constituency associations. And he promises that he will first negotiate uh, better uh, terms with the European uh, Union, with the authorities of the European Union, and therefore having, re 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 as he sees it, reformed the European Union, then clearly offered to the British public, they would all w rush forward to endorse this new uh, method and this new system, and, you know, Cameron would be duly delighted and have won his third referendum in a row. Well, as I hardly need tell you, it didn't play out like that. Um, the, first of all, the negotiations with the European Union do not go well. Cameron attempts to argue that they had met Brit you know, some of British demands, but they didn't meet any of the demands he'd outlined at the beginning, and he certainly didn't manage to convince the public of that. And I think viewed objectively, I mean, here we're all in difficulties because everybody has their own view, but I think viewed objectively, there was not any significant real change. So Cameron found himself having to fight in a referendum campaign in which having promised to change the nature of Britain's relationship with the uh, uh, European Union or within the European Union, he had not done so. And that was a very difficult background for his fight and it didn't help um, that it, shall we say, didn't lead to any sort of massive enthusiasm for the European Union. And one feature of all of this politics that's worth bearing in mind is that those, and this remains the case today, those who, are, who argue that Britain should remain in the European Union fundamentally do so because they argue it would be bad to leave. What they don't do so is say, I mean, one or two do, but very rarely, it's not as, the, as it is in some parts of the continent, they don't tell you marvellous things about the European Union. They tell you bad things about what would happen to Britain if it left, what's known as Project Fear uh, by its critics, fairly or unfairly. So Cameron finds himself fighting a referendum in which, against the background of relatively little enthusiasm for the European Union, essentially arguing that, yes, he had, you know, you know, I mean, uh, as it were, we are where we are, it would be a bad thing to leave, and we must stay. Now, that's not an easy political thing. If you like, the vision thing was missing. 
I think it's fair to say if you look at Cameron as a whole, he was never good at the vision thing. Uh, in 2010, in the general election, he failed to really explain to the electorate why they should vote Conservative. And I think it's fair to say that um, uh, his party underperformed as a result uh, compared to what it should have done. There was a terribly unpopular Labour government, a terribly unpopular Labour uh, Prime Minister in Mr Brown. The economy was in a complete mess and the government had been in for 13 years and the British have this kind of sense that the fair idea of politics is you give each side a turn. And, you know, the idea was really it was time for the other people to be in. And despite all of those things, Cameron still failed to engender a majority and in part he just didn't have the vision thing. He wasn't actually a very good politician. So 2016, he's the man in charge of trying to keep Britain in and the referendum itself therefore in part becomes, as so often happens, a refer and here I'm talking about what happened in 2016. I'm not talking about what you might say now happened in 2016. There is, there is a big difference. In 2016, and to a considerable extent for a lot of people, not for everybody, this becomes a referendum on the Cameron administration. And Cameron, the lack of Cameron's popularity is reflected, I would suggest to you, as one of the factors, not the only factor, but as one of the factors in the vote. Um, and, you know, Cameron didn't want that to occur, but he wasn't popular, and I think that was a significant factor. Number two, another factor very central to 2016. 2016 saw what has hitherto been the culmination in Europe of the anxiety and crisis about a sense of being swamped, I'm using that in inverted commas, I would not use that term, but it's about being swamped by uh, illegal immigrants from the Middle East and more generally from outside. I mean, a lot of this had to do with the Syrian crisis, but many of the immigrants themselves were not from Syria, large number from Afghanistan, large number from Eritrea, etc., large number from Libya, etc. And as you may recall, and there's no reason why you should recall, in 2016, um, large numbers of immigrants came into Greece from Turkey because the Turkish government ceased, which was in a difficult position, ceased to, uh, to stop them doing so and wanted to put pressure on Europe. Uh, and they started to move through the Balkans with successive governments finding that what they tried to do to stop immigrant movements failed. And then, of course, Chancellor Merkel said that she would happily take a million immigrants and uh, this encouraged even more to press forward. That caused a crisis within the European Union as a whole. Britain was only just one of the players there because a number of European states, most obviously Poland, for example, Denmark, uh, Hungary said they didn't want to take any more of these immigrants and then they weren't particularly impressed when the European Commission under pressure from Germany and from those states such as um, Italy and Spain and Greece, all of which were affected by immigrants coming across the Mediterranean or the Aegean, said that immigrants should be shared out. Well, I think it's fair to say that that did not go terribly well down in Britain. Britain was already having a sort of a degree, a strong degree of uneasiness, in particular about the rise of Islam in Britain. Um, the uh, Muslim population is the largest population among immigrants, a sense that the original hopes that immigrants would, as it were, Muslim immigrants might sort of fit in, uh, were increasingly disillusioning, disillusioned, there had been some atrocious terrorist atrocities, and it didn't really play well uh, with domestic public opinion, and this was accentuated when fairly or unfairly, and again, you can take your point of view, uh, the question of whether uh, Turkey might eventually join the European Union was pushed to the fore as a campaigning issue. Uh, Cameron said, uh, well, this will never happen, and the Brexiteers were 
um, sort of didn't agree with him on that. They thought that this might happen, the European Union might go in that direction. And given that this would have been the only referendum that would have been being held, this seemed obviously, presumably to some people, an opportunity to express their view on their sense of changing in British society, the changing nature of British demographics, um, and a more specific anxiety about Islam. So that was, I think, an important issue in 2016, which has rather been lost from sight since, because it's not been pushed to the fore to the same extent uh, um, subsequently. So these were both issues. On top of that, there was, I think it's fair to say, a degree of malaise. I mean, uh, if you think about it, this was a post-industrial society that was taking part in major structural economic and social changes uh, with crises for many people in the traditional working class and all of those leading to high levels of anxiety. And I think it's fair to say that the idea of the neoliberal economics, the open boundaries, the sense that people in the wealthier areas didn't really care about the poor, uh, all of that uh, helped to throw fat on the fire. So you get um, the vote occurring in 2016, and that vote can be understood in a number of ways. Um, there was a majority, obviously, for Brexit. If you want to try and break down the figures, um, essentially, older people tended to vote more for Brexit, younger people more for Remain. The old tend to vote more than the young, uh, and that was definitely a factor. Secondly, there was a donut effect. The wealthier and the poorer both voted for Brexit in the sense that people who owned their own home without a mortgage, the majority of them voted for Brexit. People who were tenants, the majority of them voted for Brexit. People who owned their own house but were still paying a mortgage, the majority of them uh, voted for Remain. Uh, although we're, not, we're talking about marginal changes of maybe about 10% difference. We're not talking about stark divides. Um, in England, which is overwhelmingly the demographic um, sort of dominant partner, uh, in England um, and in Wales, the majority voted for Brexit. In Scotland and Northern Ireland, the majority voted for Remain. Um, the standard view would be, often from people who don't look at the figures very closely, that it was stupid people in the north of England. Actually, that's a canard. That's ridiculous. It was overwhelmingly the ability of the Brexiteers to do very well in southern England, where the, where the population is more preponderant. Overwhelmingly, that was much more significant. And also, I find it quite offensive. Whether you agree or disagree with people, I find it highly offensive in a democracy to refer to people who do or don't have the views that you hold as if in some ways that's meritorious or unmeritorious. So I'll just uh, make that point uh, because one of the least attractive aspects of the entire debate um, is the way in which people have subsequently vilified those who don't vote the way that they think they should. And I, I, I find that really quite troubling um, and actually fairly disgusting uh, to listen to people implying that those that didn't vote the way that they thought they should vote were suffering from false consciousness. In other words, you know, I know the right answer, you don't vote that way because you're stupid or because you've been led astray because you're too stupid not to understand the propaganda thrown at you. Actually, that's fairly disgusting, that kind of approach, because what you're fundamentally saying is you don't believe in democracy. Uh, that's what you're fundamentally saying. So I think that the subsequent debate about it has not been a particularly um, enhancing one, which whether you're looking at the Brexiteers or the Remainers, it's not been particularly enhancing. But at the time, I think it's fair to say that the vote... Um, can be explained by a multitude of factors, but the answer is we don't know, really. I mean, it is a secret ballot. Um, the uh, people were not 
polled to any great extent as to why they had done things, and there's been no real, in my view, uh, satisfactory analysis of it. Um, so you get, I mean, there's already been academics who've produced uh, accounts saying it's nostalgia for empire, which is a rather odd view, given that of those people we know, or we think we know, voted for Brexit. I'd say it's more like a little Englander approach than a, uh, than a nostalgia for empire. But academics rush in to offer explanations where angels are much more prudent about offering analysis. So anyway, that was the situation in 2016. Well, Cameron compounded the mess that he'd made of British politics. And one ought to make out quite clear that his Chancellor of, Ex of the Exchequer and his sidekick, very close ally, George Osborne, had pressed him repeatedly not to have a referendum and had told him he would be stupid to do one. So, you know, he'd very much followed his own view. Cameron compounded the situation by resigning next day. In other words, not really uh, permitting any sort of leisurely process of at least reflecting on what had happened. Uh, and that, of course, triggered on the one within Britain the political crisis of needing to find a new prime minister. Uh, the other thing that compounded it, which again tends to be forgotten about by both the Brexiteers and the Remainers, was the response of the European Commission. The European Commission, Mr Juncker, instead of getting on a plane, landing in London, giving some press conference saying, do you know, we're really quite, don't want to see you go, I wonder if we could have a further chat about this, um, or just doing anything, did nothing. And there is always the view that the European Commission wanted Britain out, um, and in fact that the most hilarious aspect of the current mess in Britain is they might find it difficult to get rid of the British. So that's, that's you know, I mean, unintentional consequences are always amusing to the historian, or should be. Um, anyway, the British had a contest. The contest generated as, its, as the new Prime Minister, the new leader of the Conservative Party, Theresa May, who was a Remainer, she had voted Remain, um, but who took the view, as a number of uh, senior Conservatives did, um, that the you know, that the, the, the referendum had been agreed in the party manifestos, it had been agreed overwhelmingly by Parliament, it was the democratic mandate, and therefore it should happen. And on the basis of that, Theresa May began her negotiations with the European uh, uh, Commission to try and produce an agreed deal to leave. Um, and she managed to do that, to the surprise of a lot of people, um, she managed, in fact, to negotiate a deal which was satisfactory as far as the British government was concerned and the majority of the cabinet and was satisfactory as far as the majority of the governing party was concerned and was satisfactory as far as the European um, Commission was concerned. Unfortunately for Theresa May's perspective, and maybe for everybody else, you can have your own view on this, um, she didn't have a majority in Parliament anymore because the 2016 general election had seen the Conservatives get more votes than anybody else, but not get a majority of the seats. So, and she was also faced by, on the one hand, the opposition of the chief opposition party, the Labour Party, which couldn't make up its mind what it wanted, but certainly didn't want the Conservatives to get a uh, deal. Um, and on the other hand, uh, about a group of Conservative MPs who called themselves the Spartans, who wanted to reject the deal because they didn't think it went far enough. And on the basis of that, Parliament voted down the deal three times. Um, uh, Theresa May decided that she was part of the problem and she resigned, um, uh, leaving uh, actually what I thought was one of the most hilarious uh, uh, remarks in a Prime Minister's uh, question time. You know, Corbyn, at the, her last meeting uh, with Parliament as Prime Minister, Cor Jeremy Corbyn, as the leader of the opposition, was having a go at her and she said to him, well, you know, and he was saying, well, most of your party want you to go, and she replied, well, at least I know when it's time to go, you don't, um, which I thought was actually very accurate and very true. Um, so she re retired uh, re as Prime Minister, resigned as Prime Minister, 
the Conservatives pre had a new, new uh, choice of uh, leader uh, that after the standard uh, process, which is now that you, uh, the parliamentarians get it down to two candidates, and those two candidates then go to the party in the country, all the party members can vote on it, and Boris Johnson becomes leader. And again, to the surprise, I think, of a lot of people who'd assumed that Johnson would go for a no-deal exit, Johnson manages to negotiate a deal uh, with the European Commission. Um, he manages to do that. Um, he then goes to Parliament, and I think it's fair to say that he realises that while Parliament is willing to vote for the principle of the deal, which it does, they are not willing to make it easy for him to actually get the deal through. So he decides to go for a general election, and that is where we now are. We are having a general election on December the 12th. In Britain, by law, uh, you have to give four weeks' notice for a general election. He's given slightly more, which I think he may regret, but that's another matter. Um, but, um, you know, politics is much quicker um, in Britain than it is in the United States. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. I think also whatever does happen in terms of the... Uh, of the um, distribution of seats, I think it's very unclear to work out how that will affect government business. Uh, the one thing I'm willing to predict on referenda is I think within the next 15 years there will be another referendum in Scotland and that would probably lead to Scotland becoming independent, but that's a different question. I said I'd make some general points, so I wonder if I could make some general points about the nature of this with reference to the word, form of history. And if I irritate anybody here, I'm pleased about that, because a good job for a historian is to make people think, and many people these days find thinking irritating. So let's start off with one of the major points. Commentators, whether journalists or academics, are apt to group things together and they are apt to find uh, some commonality. Let's say the mid-17th century general crisis is one of the more famous ones, or the Atlantic Revolution of the late 18th century is another one. And you can already see the people that have been writing lazy and easy newspaper columns and sort of you know, organising their lectures around the idea that uh, Brexit is a part or an aspect of a worldwide populism, etc., 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 and then reading from one country to another. Um, I think that's rather facile. I think the politics in each country are rather different. I think the nature of the issues are rather different. Um, and I think that there is too easy, you know, it's too easy to imagine that Mr. Johnson is the equivalent of President Trump or vice versa. Um, it's too, too easy to discuss British politics as if it was like French politics or Italian politics or Hungarian politics. I think this is not very helpful. And as I said, I think it's rather facile. That's point number one. Point number two, the, um, the desire that is very strong in this, uh, in this episode for people to self-identify within a tribe, whether that tribe is the Brexiteer tribe or the Remain Remainer tribe, has meant that there's been a tendency to underlook the, uh, or overlook, I suppose I should say, sorry, I got that one wrong, to overlook the extent to which there are similarities between the two. And the most obvious similarity to me is that both sides are instrumentalists. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that they argue, um, you back us and we will solve your problems. And that essentially is the common position of both sides or of most of their commentators. But the reality is, of course, that uh, there are many serious problems that Britain needs to address maybe it's easy for me to say that, but I think Britain needs to address, that might or might not be marginally affected uh, by Brexit or Remain, but which are not central to that. I mean, how best to deal with people's assumptions about um, the, the existence, continued existence of current-day social welfare systems, how to cope with the change in labour, that labour, uh, by which I mean work, that's coming with artificial intelligence. Uh, how to address environmental issues. All of these 
are, are, are matters that, um, you know, they would be marginally changed by whether we were or were not in the European Union, but they are not fundamentally dependent on it. That's point one. Point two, there seems to be a reluctance on both sides to accept that there are both problems if Britain is either in the European Union or outside the European Union, and opportunities if Britain is either inside the European Union or outside it. Neither side really seems to wish to deal uh, with the idea that maybe membership is both good and bad and leaving is both good and bad. And that's true of both politicians and commentators and the academics who have already sort of launched a thousand conferences on the basis of this, uh, this issue. Thirdly, in looking at it cephalogically in voting terms, people tend to focus on the keen supporters or the keen opponents. They don't really seem to address the fact that, you know, insofar as we can tell, and I'll un underline that, yes, there were keen supporters and keen opponents, as there are to this present day, but there were also people in the middle who didn't really know which side they wanted to support or whether they wanted to support other, I, either side. And that view tends to be lost. Um, I think that's a, uh, a, uh, a, you know, a point that needs to be underlined because that's true of most issues in history. Um, you know, if you look at, for example, if you look at wars, if you look at the English Civil War or the American Revolution, a large number of people who were not loyalists or royalists, but actually, sorry, loyalists or revolutionaries, but actually just didn't want to know or focus, would rather focus on bringing in the harvest or whatever. So this kind of sort of Manichaean sense is not only do I find vaguely disgusting in a civic society, but also is actually analytically deeply flawed as well. If I might I'll add a last point, and then there is time for questions or points from the floor. Um, to me, and I am a political historian ultimately, and obviously interests like international relations and military things are fundamentally on the political timetable. In other words, by what I mean by the political timetable, is the events of the day, the week, the month, the year are crucially important. Now, there is an entirely legitimate historical interpretation and approach that looks for a different kind of timetable. I call it the non-political timetable. And they're looking for, you know, tendencies of maybe the decade or the century or the millennium. And they are entirely worthy, and I've got nothing to criticise. But I don't think that that approach is necessarily helpful in political history terms. What one has is first the role of con contingency and conjuncture. In other words, it's entirely possible that in different circumstances there would have been different results, and we can see that already as we are shaping up to the general election, which is a general election. I have many friends who are politicians. None of them has the faintest idea what's going to happen on December the 12th, and they're the supposed professionals. So how on earth are people who aren't professionals are supposed to know, uh, who don't have any access to confidential polling data, I simply don't know. Uh, so I would make that point. Um, but what it does do, and I think this in a way is, if you like, if you want to use the jargon of motivational sort of charlatans, and I would hope I'm not a motivational charlatan, um, it does in fact encourage one to feel to a degree empowered. Because forget about the notion that there are grand impersonal forces in history, whether you want to um, talk about them in sort of Marxist terms of socioeconomic structures or ludicrous terms of, you know, in which discourses of sexuality or gender are mobilized to fulfill some sort of historical purpose. Instead, think about it that in any circumstance, and we've seen it repeatedly in Britain in the last five years, the choice of large numbers of individuals at particular moments has made so far uh, a, a difference to at least the political environment and at least to pushing issues to the fore. The tension over Brexit is precisely that the electorate was given a choice, 
And in that choice, a majority voted for a particular way, which it has then proved very difficult to persuade the political structure to, um, in, you know, to as it were, uh, implement. But the very fact that they put that on the, uh, whether you agree or disagree, that they put that on the agenda reflected an awareness and sense that individuals can make a difference. And that, I think, is important as an aspect of a democratic society. But the other aspect of a democratic society, which we are losing sight of in Britain, and which I fear you are like losing sight of in the United States, is that in a democratic society is not about winning, it's believing that the other side has a legitimate right to hold power if they win. And I fear that in both Britain and the United States, that necessary aspect of civic society is being attenuated at the moment, and I regret that. Thank you very much. Well, I, whilst the organisation brings out the champagne and the caviar and the quail's eggs, I think I might be able to answer a few questions, or I hope so. Yes, sir. Hello. Thank you. Um, so, um, my reading of Brexit is that one of the large problems that uh, has occurred since 2016 is that... Um, Neither party has been able to develop a firm consensus towards leave or remain. Um, neither party has been able to mobilize supporters for one side or another. And yet, um, I think your talk does a good job in highlighting that historically there has been a consensus in both parties uh, towards Euroscepticism. So my question is why on the one hand with uh, Euroscepticism uh, in these parties and on the other hand with uh, a clear referendum towards uh, Brexit, uh, has there been such difficulty in getting uh, a deal or an exit? Uh, well, passed? I think, first of all, yes, there is both Euroscepticism and Euro enthusiasm, well, enthusiasm, Euro support, shall we say, in both political parties. Remember, the electorate was divided. Yes, there was a majority for Brexit, but the, you know, there was a significant vote for Remain, and uh, in particular in Scotland, you know, there was a very clear majority. So I would say that the difficulty is that this is an issue, first of all, in which the British have very little experience in working out what to do if there is a referendum result which, in which there is limited enthusiasm in Parliament. Second of all, it's impacting in a very dynamic, and uh, not necessarily happily dynamic, constitutional situation. So new constitutional bodies like the Supreme Court, which wasn't there 20 years ago, um, the uh, Scottish Parliament, uh, which wasn't there 30 years ago, the Welsh Assembly, ditto, new bodies of that type, plus other things that weren't there 30 years ago, party members electing the leader of the Conservative Party and the leader of the Labour Party, none of that was there 30 years ago. So in terms of constitutionalism, in terms of institutional formulations, and in terms of political practice, we are in a difficult position even if we didn't have Brexit. So the fact that Brexit is divisive then plays through this position of constitutional complexity. Yeah, well, somebody, anyway. Do you want to take the... Uh... Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you about um, kind of the dynamic of British governments ever since 1945, um, attempting to champion kind of the intergovernmental aspects of the European project and repress the more... I guess, federal, ever closer union aspects. You mentioned it in relation to Thatcher in the 1980s, you know, and that on the horizon she kind of sees this horrifying in her, in her sense, European superstructure. But obviously that's been an aspect that every British government has tried to kind of combat ever since Attlee with, you know, the Schuman proposals and the Churchill government and the European Defense Force. Um, and I was just wondering, and even Ted Heath, you know, the Europhile prime minister, still, you know, trying to repress the commission and kind of build up the power of the council and the European, you know, project. And I was just wondering, as somebody who's written extensively on, obviously, pre-1945 Britain as well, 
Do you see any aspects in the British kind of historical tradition um, or even English national psyche that kind of make them tend towards that intergovernmental aspect? And most people's explanation is that they have a much Sorry, longer... Sorry, let me answer the question, okay? All right, let okay. You, they, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and if everybody else could ask short questions, then everybody can have a chance. Um, I think the traditional nature of British government was to be where, and British politics, was to be wary of structures that affected British domestic affairs. So in other words, there was quite, they were quite happy to join NATO, they were quite happy to play a key role in the establishment of what eventually becomes the Commonwealth. Um, they were interested in notions of a West European Union in the late 40s and 50s, a defence union essentially. Um, but I think that the, um, the dynamic in traditionally in Britain, this may be changing, the dynamic traditionally was not of a descending theory of government from a kind of federal entity. So I think that's what I would say, and that that made a considerable degree of wariness. Um, and, I mean, it's interesting at the present moment. I mean, I'm very happy to be corrected, but I'm not aware that the <coughs> Remain side has urged that we should join the Euro, for example. So I think that even the most ardent Remainer is wary of a lot of the European project at the moment. I may be wrong, but I, I would say that from that point of view, there is a difference in the public culture in Britain to say the public culture of France, and that difference will remain whether or not Britain leaves the European Union. So, you know, to my mind, and this again, you know, I like to think outside the box. I don't think there's any point giving a lecture if you just tell people what they can read in an op-ed piece in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. Uh, to, from my point of view, actually, the Brexit issue, I know this is going to sound very odd, is secondary or almost irrelevant. I mean, it's reflecting political crisis in Britain. That political crisis will continue. But what I think is much more fundamental is a wariness about European convergence. And from that point of view, I can understand President Macron's vision of a multi-speed Europe in which Britain is outside the core. I think that makes a lot of sense from his perspective. Next. Yeah, sir. A question, not a speech, OK? <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk about the impact of a Brexit on um, Ireland and Northern Ireland and that border becoming a hard border, given the conflict at that border and the tensions, et cetera. Yes, thank you. Um, well, rather like, I mean, again, taking on my theme, rather like, um, as with Scottish separatism or nationalism, um, the issues in Ireland, Northern Ireland, are not new. They've not been provoked by Brexit. I mean, Brexit may well provide a, um, a narrative that pushes them towards a particular crisis. But in essence, in Northern Ireland was already in crisis. The, uh, the joint government had broken down. Stormont, which is the Northern Ireland, Par Northern Irish Parliament, is in effect in, you know, re recess. Um, and I think it's fair to say that Northern Ireland was already in difficulties before the Brexit issue came to a height. Uh, the, the question at the present moment is the British government has decided that its deal with the European Union is going to be one which, um, as it were, leaves Northern Ireland inside a free trading area with the South. The, uh, Protestant nationalists in the north don't like that. I think it's fair to say that it reflects the extent to which there is only, and this is you know, a controversial view, but I'll say it, there's only limited support these days in England in particular for Ulster nationalism. Um, and I think both the Protestants and the Catholic nationalists in the north have a problem. Um, the English don't fundamentally want the Protestant nationalists. 
and the Irish don't fundamentally want the Catholic nationalists, who are mostly, you know, not very nice people with a tendency to kill people, you know. I mean, it's like taking Mexico into the Union. Um, so I think that there is, a, that's unfair, the tendency to take half Mexico into the Union. Um, the, um, I'm not sure what is going to happen in, um, as far as Ireland is concerned. I assume that at some stage there is unification between the North and the South. I assume at some stage. But I think that's a, a longer-term thing than Scottish independence. But I don't know. Yes, sir. Go on, project your voice. Try. Right, the question I've been asked is what is the impact that the Brexit party is going to have on the, de on the December elections? The answer, obviously, is I don't know. Neither does anybody else. I mean, the Brexit party or its equivalents, UKIP before it, have traditionally done better in European elections, in other words, elections held in Britain towards the, you know, the British members of parliament, the European parliament, than they have in national elections. On the other hand, if the vote is close, then it could mean that the Conservatives don't win a number of seats, and that could well jeopardise their position. I simply don't know. It, if it is assumed, I'll tell you what is assumed at the moment, it is assumed at the moment that the Conservatives are going to lose seats in Scotland, they are going to lose seats in London, and they may, may well lose a few seats in the South West to the Liberal Democrats. The last is least clear, but certainly the first two seems, most people seem to agree. If that is the case, then they need to win seats in the Midlands and the North of England. In order for them to do that, they will need to persuade people who don't traditionally vote Conservative that they are so angry that Brexit hasn't happened that they are keen and willing to vote, at least on this occasion, for the Conservatives. That would be jeopardised if, if those voters instead vote Brexit. So, from the Conservative point of view, uh, the situation at the moment is not looking terribly happy, um, which then throws the situation up to the next level, which is if no political party wins an absolute majority, what is likely to happen? Well, what I would suggest to you, I may be totally wrong, what I would suggest to you is that the Conservatives are going to find it difficult to win the support of other political parties in order to put together another coalition government. So remember, there have been, in effect, coalition governments from 2010 to 2015, Conservatives and, um, you know, uh, Liberal Democrats, and from 2016 to, 2017, sorry, to the present, uh, Conservatives and Ulster Protestants, DUP. Um, there is no such prospect of either of those. Neither of those were allied with the Conservatives. So you have the next question is, would they form a government with Mr Corbyn's Labour Party? And that is where the uncertainty is. Um, and that, in fact, is going to have to make them think very hard and the electors think very hard about what, you know, where they're at and what they might want to support. Yes, sir. Um, well, there is a constitution in Britain. It's just not... A, it, it, remember, we're in the United Kingdom. We're not in England alone. Uh, the, uh, there is a constitution. It's just not the, quite the same form as the constitution in the United States. The constitution reflects a number of laws which govern uh, relationships between the parts and laws and practices which govern relations between the parts. If what you're saying to me is what do I personally think, the answer is, as I indicated at the beginning, I am not particularly keen to get into personal views. I do think that ignoring the result of the referendum is not wise if what you want to do is to encourage people to have a sense of the, pol of the politics of their country as a community and if you want to encourage people to vote. Now, on the one hand, we have politicians 
urging people to vote in elections, if you then have a vote, which in this case a referendum, and you then ignore the result, then I'm not quite sure how that matches that kind of policy. But, you know, these are obviously wiser people than me, and what do I know? But, you know, that would be my assessment of it, that it is unattractive and that it compounds what is known in the jargon when people talk about the European Union. The phrase that is frequently applied is the democratic deficit, the idea that you have unaccountable bodies, which, uh, such as the European Commission, which can ignore referenda or tell countries to re-hold their referenda, which, of course, has happened in the past, um, and the, the, this is not an attractive aspect. So I'm in favour of democracy. Um, and I think that, you know, if, if you expect people to do things like pay their taxes, obey the law, then you really should. There is a contract. I've, I've got a contractual notion of government. So I would say the contract has been rather breached. But other people would obviously offer you an alternative exposition. Um, one thing that I think has had... A, uh, not enough attention um, is this, that the parliamentary constituencies are supposed to be um, assessed, you know, the number, of the number of voters and redrawn by a body called the Boundary Commission. And the opposition parties have prevented the Boundary Commission um, sort of uh, findings being implemented for quite a few years. So I think we have what I would call an unreformed House of Commons, to use language from the 19th century. I mean, it's not as egregious as the joke of your country, where, of course, California has the same number of uh, senatorial representatives as Wyoming, and Americans will tell you they live in a democracy. Uh, so it's not as big of a joke as that. But nevertheless, I think it's becoming a serious problem and I think that that will, if we're not careful, uh, impact with the attitudes of a lot of people. Because a referendum, whether you like or not the result, a referendum is one in literally every single person's vote counts. And if you don't or you do like what you're being asked to vote on, you can literally try and persuade people to vote for your side, or not to vote uh, on for the other side, knowing that every vote counts. Well, that, alas, is not the case in a parliamentary election, same in your situation. And to my mind, I am very uneasy about people claiming an ethical merit under that basis for a parliamentary system as opposed to a referendum. And the argument they use is, of course, these things are terribly complicated or people don't understand it. Well, I have to tell you, um, if you think, well, obviously you do, if you think that the nation's legislators are the profound group, the kind of philosopher kings that you obviously do, then you're going to be happy with that argument. I'm not myself convinced of it. Let's just leave it like that. Yes, sir. Questions, not speeches, OK? Certainly. So would, looking at the historical context, would it be pertinent to say a conclusion would be that the a vote to leave the European Union was, uh, should we say, impossible to avoid? Oh, no, I think it was possible to avoid it. I think David Cameron, uh, whether he should, you know, I mean, should is a matter for, for you to take as a view, but he could definitely have avoided it, and he won an absolute majority in the 2015 general election as a winner... You control the patronage of government. You also control, you tend to have the affection of your supporters because you've won. It enables you to say, do you know, on reflection, thinking about things and the mature needs of the country, I have decided that it would be better to revisit this issue in a few years' time, and I instead am going to get on with this, that or the other. And, you know, he could have got away with that. Um, but I think uh, he lacked, I mean, you know, whether you think that was a good or a bad idea, I, the point is, I think he was foolishly glib. He was a really, you know, his background was in public relations. He believed he could get away with things, and he got it wrong. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, madam, sorry, sir, sir. Uh, 
you. That's a good question. Well, first of all, the major challenge to finances at the moment are the astonishingly ambitious spending programmes of both the Conservatives and the Labour Party at the moment. That's far more serious than anything to do with Brexit or Remain. Um, you know, in a way, once Britain decided not to join the euro, it was exactly as you describe it. Um, it's responded, as you know, to uh, the 2008 crisis by fiscal crisis, by a process of printing money like nobody's business, rather like the United States, rather like the eurozone. Um, so I would say it's part of a more general financial crisis rather than being something specific to the British. And you see, as far as international investors are concerned, uh, yes, Britain is not a marvellous deal at the moment, but then neither is the euro or the American dollar. Uh, both of them are, you know, have got problems. Um, I mean, the Americans have the great benefit that they are the currency of reserve, so that's their great benefit. But they're asked, well, while America's economic fundamentals are very good, its fiscal fundamentals are terrible. Uh, so I'm not sure that, I, you know, I'm not sure I'd see Britain in the Iceland category. I think it's part of a more general crisis of printing more money than people really are aware of. And the public, and the same problem in the United States, the same problem in Europe, same problem in Japan, the public being used to, be, to extraordinarily low uh, interest rates, being used to the idea that, that capital has no cost, um, and these are fundamentally deeply flawed propositions. So I would say that, you know, going back to my point, which I was trying, maybe I didn't underline it enough, I think there are fundamental problems that have got nothing to do with Brexit. And I think what is the case is most people, the politicians, the public, the commentators, would rather focus on Brexit or Remain because those are graspable things. You know, if you were to tell them, forget about Brexit, what are you going to do to restore integrity to the fiscal system? They have, that's a much worse problem. So no wonder they'd rather talk about Brexit. Yes, sir. Yes, I think you're right. I think Parliament, as a there has been a marked lessening of confidence uh, elsewhere in the country, outside Parliament, in Parliament's ability to manage its business. I mean, obviously, there are particular factors. The Speaker of the House has been widely perceived as biased, um, uh, but the you know both major political parties are coalitions, and in these cases, the coalitions have broken down. And it's by no means clear how you move business forward in that context. Um, I think it's fair to say that the main opposition party, the Labour Party, has been particularly unhelpful in the sense that it's neither tried to kill Brexit nor to kill Remain. And, you know, that has meant that the whole thing has drifted remarkably. But you're absolutely right. I mean, I'm fascinated that you that use the term process. I would describe it as a slow-moving crisis. The process seems to me to be often, you know... And the, what really dismayed people was when they had this idea of indicative votes you know we can't reach a deal so let's at least try and find out which issues the majority of parliament would vote for they couldn't even get indicative votes through so you know going back to the, the charming gentleman over there who believes in philosopher kings in parliamentary systems giving the, par the philosopher kings a chance and queens giving the philosopher kings a chance has not worked terribly well now you know these are not evil people you know, they are not, you know, in that sense, morally deeply flawed, uh, as you would find in some legislatures in the world. You know, in some places, India, for example, you know, you can buy a lot of politicians quite easy and they seem to excuse egregious crimes by family members. So we're not talking about that kind of structure. What, in a sense, is happening instead is a almost unwillingness to note and understand 
the idea that politics might involve compromise. So one way of looking at it is to say that what you've got is an upsurge of idealism and that, uh, you know, that's again a way that people don't tend to see it. I'm, my job is to think outside the box. So that, and this upsurge of idealism is causing an enormous problem. So instead of sitting there in a smoke-filled room, bashing people's heads together and saying, we need an answer by Tuesday, the European Commission expects that, what are we going to do? And you deliver the votes. Instead of doing that, that's not happening. So what you get is the public theatre of the House of Commons, which might look marvellous on the television, but, you know, that's what it is, a public theatre at the moment. So, yes, Steve. Yes. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think Tony Blair and David Cameron were both extraordinarily flawed individuals. They believed in themselves. Let's go back to this idealism thing. I mean, in a sense, idealists are often megalomaniacs because what they're doing is saying, I have the ideal, you don't. You know, and the ideal is whatever I think. And, you know, in the case of Blair, Blair saw himself as a self-conscious moderniser. It was all New Britain. It was all the idea. So, for example, when the Millennium Dome went up, the idea of having anything to do with British history History and it trashed and it was all you know new labor new britain that was very much blair and you have to remember cameron was the tories response to blair they tried a number of other leaders first william hagee and duncan smith michael howard none of them succeeded they produced a tony blair look-alike in david cameron similarly facile public school boy but public school means private school in britain fast young looking all the rest of it um and the uh, and met very metropolitan um, and glib. Um, and the thing is, they ceased to be fit for purpose as a result of the 2008 crisis. Already by the end of 2008, you know, Cameron seemed so out of touch with the public, as indeed Blair had come to seem so out of touch, and New Labour had become a sort of joke idea. Um, so belief that you could create a new constitutional system. I mean, remember, one of Blair's brilliant ideas was also to have regional parliaments in England. I mean, he started that. He actually had a referendum in the northeast of England because he thought that was the area that would f most likely accept it, and they voted no. But it was a stupid idea because, obviously, regional parliaments in bits of England, they would just quarrel with the next-door neighbours, as it were. Um, so, you know, it was weaponising dislike, you know. So Blair Blair was very foolish. As you say, the Fixed Parliament Act, which was really uh, Cameron and the Liberal Democrats together, that was a damn silly act as well. And we've ended up with a situation of, of constitutional sort of immobility combined with a failure of compromise. Now, the constitutional problems wouldn't matter so much if people were willing to compromise. But because people aren't willing to compromise, the constitution kicks in. Now, the compromise element is quite clearly there. You can either take the view that we should remain in the European Union but basically be a semi-detached member, or we should leave the European Union and try and have a deal which keeps everybody as happy as possible, and those people who aren't happy should be told, well, bugger off if you, unless you can't win the next election. Um, but instead of which, they seem to be unable to think through that because both sides have idealised their responses. Um, and, you know, I just think this is so immature. I mean, I think this is so immature. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, 
I mean, it's not new. I remember looking at general elections in the beginning of the 2000s and thinking, well, both political parties are competing to debauch the public with promises of their own money being spent on them. You know, in other words, you raise, you raise taxes and then you promise, pe as it were, like a hidden hand, and then you offer the money to the people. And you just think, how stupid can, do they think the electorate is? And the answer is, well, probably, you know, um, the fact of the matter is that people dis get the politicians they deserve. That's the frightening aspect of it. I would like to believe in the electorate, but, you know, well, it's, sometimes one's patience is tested. But then I go on and write history books, so that's my cop-out. Yeah, yeah, one more. Sorry. Yes, sir. Yes. Can I just say that's a very good question. Can I answer it two ways? One, there is the argument, I mean, I'll just offer it to you, that actually, but for the remainder campaign, a much larger percentage would have voted Brexit. In other words, the project fear, so-called, you know, in other words, reminding people that they were going to suffer economically if they left the European Union, actually worked, and that the inherent vote for Brexit would have been significantly greater. I don't know if that's true, we can't tell. But that is one argument worth bearing in mind, that actually it did work, the Remain campaign, narrowing it to essentially only a million people people as the majority to, to leave, but they didn't manage to make it enough. So that's one argument, and that's worth thinking about, because it takes us back to how historians judge something very simply in terms of success and failure. Let's do the other one. I think it's fair to say that Remain campaign was poorly led. Labour produced Alan Johnson as their leader, a nice man, a decent fellow, but ill at the time, and nobody would describe him as charismatic. So I think that was point number one. Uh, the Liberal Democrats campaigned to stay in, but they, Nick Clegg, their leader, was widely loathed. I mean, so, you know, I wasn't know it was Clegg had stopped being leader. I can't even remember who they had leader, but their leaders were not popular. Um, Cameron uh, was not, you know, you know, he was not uh, a popular figure by 2016. So I think the leadership factor was important. Um, I think both sides... Um, proclaimed things that one might put a question mark about. Let's just put it like that. In other words, some of the Leave K claims were, uh, Brexit claims were astonishing. Some of the Remain claims were astonishing. Um, I think that the key problem for, for the Remainers was that actually quite a lot of people were fairly fed up whether fed up with the government or fed up with the European Union or fed up in some way or other. And that, I think, was more important. And that's a more general political thing. I mean, you know, politics, often people vote against what's there at the time. Um, so, I, I, you know, I wouldn't say that the Remain campaign was disastrous. I'd just say they didn't succeed. Um, and, I, and can I just add, I mean, you know, again, I mean... And this, again, I'd like to be controversial. So let me add, can I end on a controversial point? Right. Both in our, my country and in your country, we are catastrophizing at the moment. You know, Britain, the government system has collapsed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it has. It's a complete mess. Uh, we might have Scotland become independent. Well, you know, but, you know, there, these are all these things that are being talked about. In your country, Americans told me they've never seen the country so divided, et cetera, et cetera. Well, as a historian, I'm a bit wary about that. But also, I'm, you know, I'm getting old. I mean, I can remember the 1980s in Britain with the IRA nearly blowing up the government with Mr. Scargill and his Libyan and Soviet-funded, um, uh, you know, National Union of Miners trying to collapse the situation. It looked a hell of a lot worse in the 80s. Um, in the United States, I mean, really? Do you honestly think you've never been so divided? You just think about the debate within America as the Vietnam War was in its later stages. Or you just think about what it was like in the early 70s. You had Nixon not only as president, but also you had, for example, prices and wage control. Could you imagine that? I mean, you had 
had in the late 60s, early 70s, George Wallace as the third party candidate. You know, whatever you think about your politics now, you don't have anybody like George Wallace in. So, I mean, what, it, what is happening is people's catastrophization is troubling in a democracy because you create this idea that it is uniquely a crisis now and this lot ought to be swept aside and we will then create a bright new nirvana run by me, whoever me is. Actually, no. The nature of politics is generally one of moving from one crisis to another. There are particularly serious ones in both Britain and the United States at the moment. But on the other hand, for most of my life, we would have given our right arm to have unemployment rates as low as we've got at the moment, with all the strain that that seemed to cause on the social fabric. And your economy is even, as I said, the finances are rubbish, but your economy is far stronger than ours. So try and bear in mind, every time you feel depressed, just turn the television off, go and put some Schubert on, and just remember, yes, there are problems, and do you know those problems will continue and actually there are other aspects of life as well, okay?